You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners. I want to grab just a couple of minutes before we start today's podcast and let you know about a new membership community that's opening up. It's called The Sandbox. Now, The Sandbox was explicitly designed so that folks like you, who have big dreams and goals, who are working on busting through limiting labels and beliefs, who are overcoming challenges, have a place to come, A, to be encouraged, to get tips and tools, to meet other people and share ideas, and just relax. So as a member, you're going to have exclusive access to an extensive library of training, tools, and resources that have been meticulously crafted over the years. But that's not all. You are actually in the driver's seat, so you can help shape the direction of the content and the sandbox. So what's actually in the sandbox? Well, there will be expert sessions that will be tailored to your needs with a focus on the questions that come from our community. There are group learning sessions, live trainings, Q&A sessions, and we will be sharing inspiring membership success stories. You will have an opportunity to learn and grow alongside fellow Sandbox community members. If you need guidance or support, our online forum is going to be the perfect space to engage with other members, ask questions, find motivation, and share your success with the Sandbox community. We are committed to your success, and that's why we're offering monthly challenges and support check-ins, ensuring you're always on track. So click the link below and put your name either on the waiting list or sign up today for the Sandbox community, and we'll see you there where the dreams will be unleashed and you'll start making rapid progress. Hi, this is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, the podcast where we talk with inspiring guests who have challenged limiting labels and beliefs in their own lives so they can pursue and accomplish personal and professional goals. Today, our guest is Mary Ann Mercer. She is an author, speaker, psychologist, and intensive coaching co-creator, and she is the author of a new book, Bouncing Back from Difficult Times. And she co-authored many other books, including Spontaneous Optimism. Okay, so for anybody who knows me, has been listening to my podcast, who's golfed with me, and most recently said, I don't know how you're so optimistic, um, you got to know both of those titles really resonate with me. She is the host also of the podcast Positive Life Answers. Dr. Mercer appears on TV and radio, and she's been on Oprah Oprah, more than once. She's quoted in many publications, including Medium, Fitness Health, Fitness and Health, those two different publications, Martha Stewart and Fitbit. That's quite a range of publications. And she (laughs) delivers speeches and workshops and co-founded the self-help website, PositiveLifeAnswers.com. Way to go, Mary Ann. You know, she's, you know, it sounds great when you write, read a list of things that someone's accomplished and it can sound like, oh, she must just be this gifted person, which she is. Um, And just everything came easy to her. But the truth is she's actually overcome a number of obstacles in her own life. And so that allows her to help others by sharing her story and also to pass on what they can do to have the life that they want. Um, and transform the quality of their lives to create the life they desire. So no labels, no limits audience, you know, we're going to have a good conversation with Marianne today. With that, Marianne, welcome to the No Labels, No Limits podcast. Formally, we've been chatting already, but yes, we have. I'm so honored to be here today with you, Sarah. Well, I'm looking forward to it. We were joking around before we started (laughs) about just you know, life and different things and um, how technology, Marianne showed up on my calendar as Michael. I figured this out, right? <laughs> that wasn't the, that's not the computer she meant to send me that from. But um, anyway, <laughs> I'm glad it was Marianne and not Michael, because I don't know how I would have punted if a Michael showed up on here. Absolutely. <laughs> but let's go back to talk about, you know, 
two things I want to start with. I want you to talk a little bit about your background and some of the obstacles you had to overcome so that people don't just think you woke up one day and arrived in this great space. It's interesting what you mentioned just a moment ago about luck. On a recent podcast, uh, some emails I got from some listeners were, Dr. Mary, you're lucky. And so I had a whole podcast, part of a podcast on what is the luck factor <laughs> and why I am so lucky. Well, um, spill, spill a little bit about that. Absolutely. Let me share with you a story about someone I know. Her name is Victoria. Throughout her life, Victoria was called names. As a baby, she fell down a flight of stairs and hit her head and her parents took her to the emergency room and a doctor and upon examination, a doctor said, Victoria is damaged. In grammar school, Victoria had trouble with learning. She had lots of challenges with learning and her teachers put her in the slow learning group and that's what they called it at that time. Victoria felt humiliated and she further fell behind. In high school, Victoria continued to have academic problems. And as a result, she started to hang around what she thought was the cool kids. And the cool kids got in trouble a lot. And so did Victoria. <laughs> One of the counselors called up her parents and said, you know, Victoria is troubled and delinquent. In her senior year of high school, Victoria met a teacher. And her name was Joy. What a beautiful name. And Joy saw something in Victoria, saw some potential, saw that she was actually a good kid at heart. So she invited her to stay after school and talk with her. Victoria thought she was in trouble, so she was a little bit nervous. So Victoria met with her and they developed a rapport and Joy gave her assignments to do to help her get interested in learning. Victoria liked that. So she started those creative assignments and met with the teacher and the teacher was just empowering her and encouraging her to the point that Victoria started getting interested in learning. And at that point, Victoria wanted to go to college. So she met with her guidance counselor. Her guidance counselor looked at her school records saying, you're delinquent. You're, make the you're at the bottom of the class. You make the upper part of the class possible and no four-year university would accept you. And Victoria's heart sunk and she left there in tears. And, you know, and to this day, people still call Victoria names. They call her Dr. Dr. Marianne Victoria Mercer. And that's the that's springboard of the conversation. Oh, <laughs> that's great. So, yeah, I had challenges throughout my whole life even from being a baby and on. But something, I felt something in my heart that there was greater things for me. So I became a dreamer. <laughs> I would dream of a different life. In fact, some adults called me a dreamer and they kind of laughed at me. And uh, Are you Pollyanna I, ever? Sometimes. <laughs> but I had a vision. Yeah. I wasn't a dreamer. I had a vision. I had a vision of my life. My family, bless their hearts, they were wonderful parents. They were loving, they were encouraging, but they struggled. They had kind of a lack mentality and everything was a struggle for them financially and, and just coping with life. And I didn't want to be that way. I wanted to be loving like them, but I didn't want to carry on that, what I call a curse of lack. So um, my brother is older than me. He was the first one to go to college and he encouraged me. He encouraged me, and then my parents got on board with that. But they said, we encourage you to go to school, but we can't pay for it. So I had to come up with ways to do that as well. But I didn't let any of those little blocks or any discouragement or name calling at that point stop me. But I worked hard from there. How did, somebody emailed me and said, well, how did you take the leap from that counselor's office to going to college? Well, I went into problem solving mode and that's what optimistic people do. They go into problem solving mode. I kind of pick brains of people and they said, go to a junior college for a year, prove yourself, get your grades up and then anybody will take you. So learning was still a challenge and I had to spend more time taking notes and because I did have a little bit of a learning problem. But who cared? I didn't care. I kept going. So I got on the dean's list at the junior college 
reapplied, right. reapplied, and everyone accepted me. Wonder so, yes, hard work. High school is. <laughs> do you want to hear the rest of that story? I, <laughs> I love that story because there are so many <laughs> junctures in that story where someone put a label on you that you just yes. basically threw off. That's why I like your show, No Labels, you know, because it really hit me in my heart. Um, I became an expert uh, in working with women as a psychologist. I ran an eating disorder program at a local hospital. And a couple of clients came from that high school. And then I was invited to give a speech on body image and so forth. And who was still at the school there? That counselor. <laughs> and she was so gracious. And she apologized. She said, I'm sorry for doubting you. Well, you know, I felt so good about that, you yeah. know, and also to let her know her role is to encourage, you know, um, and to give guidance. I didn't hold that against her, but it just felt so good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it always feels good to exceed expectations, at least for me. It's like, <laughs> someone says, I don't think you can do that. It's like, OK, maybe I can't. I don't know. Watch but, me. but, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. You know, and recently an optimist people are like myself, they have a vision and they don't let people burst that bubble, you know. Um, so they just keep on persisting, persisting. And when people have hard times like I did, I think there was this other thing inside of me called faith. And a faith as small as a mustard seed is still faith. And that is kind of something I think that I've lived by. That's really well put. You know, it doesn't have to be a be a huge aha, but there's just that niggling knowing, right? Like, uh, there's something more. There's something more. There's something. I'm going to find out what that something more is. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I do want to talk about your book, but I want to ask you about going on Oprah a couple times. What was that like? Because I know everybody wants to know. <laughs> so I don't want someone going, you never asked her about Oprah. You know, talk about looking at life through rose-colored glasses. I had no idea what I was doing with marketing. You know, I did. You know, we. I had switched careers to being an author. I left my job, resigned from my job at the hospital. We wrote these books, and I had the idea, let's go on Oprah. And my father, he was alive at the time, and he kept asking me, "When are you going to go on Oprah? When are you going to go on Oprah?" And uh, all of a sudden, one day. I get a phone call from her producer saying, Oprah would like to have you on a segment of her show. You know, and wow, that was a moment you'll never forget. This is before she was getting into really deep psychological issues. She was doing 15 minute kind of testing the waters to see if people are interested in this topic. So she, she had us come on the show and I had this moment in the hallway when I saw the mail come in with two trucks and boxes. And I asked the producer, what's that? And she said, well, we get that every day. It's about 100 books that people are pitching to us yeah. <laughs> that, that they never get to. Now, I never sent them my book. That might be why they picked you. It's like she didn't just send us. I know. A she saw me in Red Book Magazine giving a comment. And somebody giving not the most favorable review of my first book, but they liked the title. And they liked when they interviewed me on the phone. So, um, but talk about not looking at the obstacles there. I just, I, I'm going on Oprah. Didn't have any doubt about it, neither did my father. And bless his heart, he was able to see that before he passed away the next year. But uh, it's that unshakable trust and faith that. We can manifest these desires and these dreams. And that's kind of what my whole philosophy is all about. Oh, I, I love it. I, I just, I feel that if, if we can embrace that and remember that, especially when we're going through hard stuff, I don't want to sugarcoat that hard stuff can throw us off our game sometimes. But Absolutely. If we're grounded and have a sense of who we are and what's possible, and we are attached to our vision. Right. And maybe that one that we're pursuing, but it may shift as we go through life and go, oh, that was kind of it. But now this is it. But yeah, we're that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. 
So let's talk about bouncing back and your, your book specifically. Okay. You know, you talk about um, some specific steps that can help us overcome difficulties or challenges when we come up. Are there a couple of key steps or strategies that you most frequently share with people that get them going? Absolutely. I, I felt inspired to write this book. I've been wanting to write it and then lockdown hit. So I went to my list of things that I haven't gotten done in a while, you know, and you know, took the time off. And, and then I started getting really busy, you know, doing you know, video or remote sessions, group sessions and individuals of people across the country. And it reminded me of the book I was thinking about, Bouncing Back from Difficult Times. And because of lockdown, it took the whole world to a level we've never seen before. But what made it really hard is when people are unhappy with their lives, they keep moving and they keep rolling and running. Lockdown really held us as a hostage emotionally and physically. We couldn't run away from our unhappiness, our troubles, or difficult times. And that's why people got so anxious and out of control and all the issues that come up about it. So what I've learned from years of experience with optimism, and then more importantly, in the last number of years, resilience, is that the way people responded to the difficult time, such as lockdown or any other traumas in their life, really determine the outcome of their life. And I think the most important thing, and I think my great nephews taught me this lesson over, over lockdown, my their parents, my original nephew, their attitude and the way they handled lockdown and worked with their kids were so fascinating that they became my subjects in study matter. They handled it calmly. And a big takeaway that I talk about in Bouncing Back is whether you respond to something as an external locus control or something internal really determines how reactive you are. While a lot of people got reactive, the people who looked at what they can control during that time, which wasn't a lot, but they would find something, taught their kids and themselves a valuable lesson that problems don't last forever. Difficult times don't last forever. I remember sitting and having a video chat with my nephew who was going through some stuff in high school right before that. And I remember saying to him, you know, this is not going to, this is not a permanent problem. Things will get better. And the shift in him was amazing said, wow, nobody taught me that. And it made a big difference in his life. So I think big takeaway, long story short on that is the way we respond to a difficult time really colors how we're going to proceed from there. And you have to, we have to accept the situation. This is the way it is. Then look at, okay, what is it that I have to change my reactions to the situation? That is really important. But also adaptability, which is hard to be flexible. A lot of people are very, they find that very challenging. Well, we don't like to be uncomfortable, right? So when no. we adapt, it's like, <laughs> I don't, it's that little kid that's, I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. it's not a question of, do you want to? We're all doing it. So how would you like to do it? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And that means some people had to take a real right turn or left turn instead so of going ahead. But I worked with uh, some clients and they used it an opportunity to stop procrastinating about making career changes. And that was a really big amount of people. Uh, one young lady, she was so unhappy with her workplace. Oh, she was a beautician. So she was unhappy, but she was very talented for her age. And they would always tap into her like, what do we do for this? What do we do for that? But they didn't treat her very nicely. And she was really unhappy. And she had thought about for a year cutting out and going on her own, and she didn't. So what happened through working with her, finding her vision, finding her purpose, where she wanted to go, she called her boss and said, you know, when you guys open up, I'm not coming back. So she, you know, rented her own studio and where she does hair and, and other services, and she's thriving and she's happy now happier now. And I went to visit her in her new place. And when I walked in, all she just burst into tears with happiness and relief that she used that time to really tap into her heart. What is it that she wanted? And she went for it. And a lot of people did that. 
I know it's encouraging, you know, and or also, did you notice like people, if they even if they didn't leave their current place of work, they quit accepting what was, well, this is how we have to do it. Instead of like, if we actually had to do it that way, we wouldn't be operating during COVID, right? Because we don't have to be there. We can think of new ways. I think it opened up some innovation um, and made things better for, I mean, frustrating for folks who just like the regularity of being in the same place all the time, but it allowed people to stretch and people who have like mad skills in certain areas could really flourish because they're going, huh. I don't need to be there, but I can add so much value because I'm, I love yes. doing this, you know, so. And I've wondered, I'm sure you've seen this as well, you know, uh, managers and bosses are more in tune with the level of um, satisfaction or happiness of their employees. So one of the things that I've been getting a lot of requests for is to, and I'm doing this in two weeks in St. Louis, um, going in and, and working with the managers and the uh, leaders how to create an optimistic, upbeat, and productive workplace, you know, and uh, talking with them about how they are role models, what they can do to become more upbeat, optimistic, and better role models, and how they can create that for their employees. Because that's a one beautiful takeaway of, of the pandemic is, uh, you know, treating employees with much more grace and helpfulness than mm. in the past. <laughs> I feel vindicated in some way, not because of the pandemic, please. No, I would have <laughs> provided that. But because there's been always a part of me and I've had, oh, I've had trouble in my career over this. I've, you know, it's been a reason I've left two, lo two places, but it's like, you don't, employees aren't just disposable. You know, they're people with right. some challenges and stuff. So when they become inconvenient, which means they have issues they need your help or support with as they work through them. It's not a time to trash them or to go, well, you're not measuring up in this way. It's like, okay, we hired you. There's a reason you're here. Let's step back and see what we can do. And I don't mean it's not that bending over backward, but there's a value that people bring and that recognizing that and helping it to shine like you talk about, like lifting up Victoria, recognize yes. Victoria. Um, instead of saying Victoria is just a pain, she's disruptive, she's missing class. I mean, there's a couple different ways you can look at every situation. And I think it's up to us, especially if we're in leadership or management, to choose the way that best serves both our, our family of people who work there and reach the business objectives we're after. Absolutely. I mean, the uh, teacher, her name was Joy, I mean, which is such an appropriate name. What if she didn't take that step with me? What if? It, yeah. yeah, what if? It's that one little thing, her grace that she shed on me, you know, by being kind and caring and being a, her, a cheerleader for me really made that first turn in my life. And then when I went to college, I, for, I met my first mentor, uh, Dr. Sam Martindale, worked with him in the biofeedback lab. And he just continued to be a role model for me as I went through college at that time. So it's really important to think about how we rub off on people around us, whether, you know, they're students, teachers, employees, bosses. Um, my husband and I both gave a talk on optimism and one of the CEOs from out East was there. And he said, you know, when I get back to the office, I'm gonna make sure I give three compliments a day. Cause that was one of the tips about creating better self-esteem and empowering an employee, I'm going to make sure I do that every single day and eliminate the word try because he said, well, I'll try to do it. He's like, no, 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 that word doesn't exist anymore because Dr. Mercer said not to use that. That's one of my, I hate that word. It's like, well, I'm going to, if someone says, well, I'll try to do that, I interpret it in my head as, okay, well, that's not going to get done, right? You either will or you won't. And it's okay. Just say, I'm not going to do it. It's okay. You don't have to. But I know it's like eliminate, try, and don't even say you're going to do it if you have no real intention, right? And it's okay. Exactly. You can fall short. Don't you find, or do you find, maybe you don't, um, but when you start looking for those opportunities to give compliments, pretty soon you can't help yourself but find nice things to say about people or about a situation. It's just like, wow, that was yeah. great. I mean, it's not hard. It becomes reflexive, I think. It really does. It creates a whole different atmosphere for everyone. 
And it creates that positive domino effect that you and I are trying to instill in everyone. Talk to me a bit more about, this is a conversation I have often with people I work with. So talk to me about, you brought up mentor in college for you, right? And then being a good role model. So what are the hallmarks of a a really successful mentor or role model in your mind, Ah. Dr. Mary? Oh, I love that. Um, I, I think my mentors, um, and as recent as about five to 10 years ago, I met my other mentor, uh, Dr. Carl Wolf, who kind of took me on a little more of a spiritual journey with that. And Dr. Wolf and, and Dr. Martin Dale, they were really optimistic leaders. They, they had traits of optimism. And that is, they, they taught me that the difference between winners and losers is that winners just pick themselves up one more time. So they instill these really empowering, encouraging lessons in people's lives. So yeah, you're going to fall. And, you know, I fell fell a few times before uh, in between these things. We could talk about that. But what did I do? I kept picking myself up. So I think a mentor is somebody who, number one, shows grace, like my teacher in high school did, is kind, encouraging, and caring. But they also are optimistic. So they teach us empowering ways, such as the biggest difference between unhappy and pessimistic people and happy and optimistic people is that people who are optimistic are problem solvers. They're like everyone else. We have challenges. We have problems. They recognize it. They kind of, uh, you know, they'll feel the feelings like everyone else, but they don't get stuck there. So an optimistic mentor really teaches you problem solving skills. So a problem comes up, you shift to what's the opportunity there. I think that is a hallmark trait of a mentor and a role model. Yeah, and I like that viewpoint that you have there. It's kind of like, okay, this is a challenge or this situation isn't one I would lovely, you know, willingly choose, but here I am in the middle of it. What does this make possible? Right? Exactly. Because it makes something possible, whether I want to acknowledge it or not, you know. Um, so I really enjoy that. Talk a little bit, though, about where you started going with um, the whole story and the mentors, but also about how that evolves into your book. Because you talk about like when you speak and you talk to the leaders and organizations, what are their takeaways? Like, do, are they examining how they show up and then how they role model in their workplace or what level of um self-reflection or self-awareness are you asking people to bring to the conversation? Well, it's interesting. I tell them they're, they're here to do work. Um, I'm not doing a rah-rah session because chasing happiness only lasts for a limited amount of time. So they're kind of shocked and like, oh, we're not, we're not going to stand up and dance and clap our hands and move around. And, <laughs> and then hopefully it lasts two, three weeks. It's like, no, we're going to dig. We're going to dig, but we're not going to do psychotherapy here. We're going to look at what are you doing, how you relate to your employees or, you know, the person you're mentoring, what skills you need to do to move them ahead. So I, I teach them really all the features of what an optimistic person is who would be the ideal role model. And so an optimistic role model teaches about problem solving, but they also look at the words that they use. So I, I have them take a lot of inventory. I have them search the words they use because words are very hypnotic, not only to yourself, but to the person you're talking to. And one you brought up before was try. I know when anyone says that I'll, I'll try to be there, or I'll try to do something, you know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I take an inventory of their words so um, they can um, be upset and anxious, or they can be encouraged and motivated. I have them do lots of flipping of their attitudes, which is words, and also the way they look at life. So I have them practice that in these workshops or one-on-one, -on -one, um, because you can only take a person so far. So if you're not feeling like you are an optimistic person, it's a little more challenging to be a role model there. So we look at their attitudes, their words, um, even the way they carry themselves. Somebody walks into my office and they're kind of like oh, looking down, not breathing, <laughs> and have this posture that's just disempowering. You know, that mind-body connection is something that we started working with. 
So we had all these executives walk around the room and and, and show them, okay, get to that bad, negative, up, upset posture, and then see how you feel. And then we had them walk around the room with their shoulders back, their head up, looking forward and connecting and how their mood shifted. And it was just so, it's always so amazing. I know it sounds so simple, but a lot of people don't think about that. Uh -huh. And and that mind body connection is you know being a biofeedback researcher back in the day, it really affects your mood. And there's been so much research, Harvard Mental Health Letter and so forth that people feel whatever they're acting. So if you want to feel happy, you need to act happy. What's a good way to do it? Is your body posture and your tone of voice. Yeah, Just if you start there. Tips. You don't. Act, it doesn't have to be real. It's like okay, I don't feel great, but if I my pot like maybe you have a cold or you've got allergies or something right and if you're thinking mm -hmm. oh man my head's so stuffy but if you at mm -hmm. least present for your own self it's not even for other people it's like for myself if i'm showing up how would i be showing up if i didn't have this oh exactly. i'd be upright i'd have my shoulders back i'd be breathing i'd be smiling maybe you know not rah, rah. so yeah. but it doesn't take long for the body to catch on and catch up for sure. And I, I call these 60 seconds, 60 yeah. second tips, you well, know, so body posture, walking, uh, head up, uh, cheerful tone of voice. There's so much research and I put that all in my book. But one of the ones that I remember that stood out to me really was important was as part of an experiment. Some uh, subjects were told to smile as they were doing these pain studies. And the people who smiled were able to tolerate a higher level of pain than the people who were told to be sad. Their pain level was much more dramatic. And it, it just blows your mind when you think of that. Yeah, you can tolerate pain if you're more upbeat, optimistic. Yeah, pain, and, just, and if you're breathing, you know, it's and, like, right. I know, I think I laugh because I do these online yoga things, right? And I'm going, okay, oh. and my wrist is killing me. So I'm going, okay. Oh. But then she always says, she goes, and if you feel like it, Turn up the edge of your mouth just a little bit. Like you don't have to uh -huh. smile, right? All of a sudden, I'm thinking, oh, I feel pretty good, right? I'm thinking before seconds before I'm thinking, okay, how long do we have to hold this, right? Then I'm going, <laughs> oh, this feels pretty good. It's so quick, you know. It is so quick. <laughs> Interesting. I nuts, but no, I was just relating because I, I started a, a Yin Yoga class, and that's a more of a holding your poses for three minutes and i haven't been in yoga for a year so i went back to that and she put us in a posture and i'm sitting there thinking after one minute oh my god how much longer is this gonna take <laughs> and, and she saw that and she said dr mary be present <laughs> be present and that was so true i was focusing on Three minutes feels like a, an hour <laughs> we have um. to be present we have to be present. Um, we have to focus on laser vision of what we want in life. And part of your question of being a good leader is is ha establishing that vision. You know what what do they what do they see in the future for themselves for their company? Um, we have specific steps we do to create that, um, but that should be your radar. Yeah. And do whether you think people are reluctant to say to you when they start working with you. I think I've lost my vision. I mean, are people oh, able yeah. to say that to you and you help them kind of figure it out again? They don't know what the what what the vision what a vision is a lot of times, but they come in and they they are people who just seem to feel stuck, kind of lost their way. So those are the ways they describe what I call losing their vision for their life. They just don't know which way they want to go, or what they want to do. Some of them come in, they do know what they want to do, but something's holding them back. So a woman I worked with recently, she's a writer, she's a very talented woman, writing for a small publication. And so she had her golden vision to write for a bigger circulation magazine. And so we did our vision and our goals and all that. And I noticed she was procrastinating, not calling, not pitching, right? So we started to look at her agony anchors what's holding you back? So we did digging, did digging, long story short, she felt guilty to have that goal because it turned out her mother was a writer 
And she always wrote for a small local newspaper and never went to the level that she wanted to. So she was upset because she thought maybe her mother would be upset if she was more successful from her. So her goal made her feel guilty, which made her procrastinate, which made her feel unsure of herself. And it just kind of dominoed there. But when she identified what was holding her back, she was able to, you know, process, make peace with it and move on. And she did talk with her mom about it. but. But you just never know when you do have a vision what can hold you back. So I call them agony anchors. Can't sail ahead if you have your anchor in the ocean and it's, <laughs> you're trying to move ahead. You know, so it's a negative feelings or agony anchor like hers, the guilt. That's such a great metaphor because it's so true, you mm -hmm. know, and it could be like an unconscious thing or it could be a resentment that's way back there that you're thinking, I wish that person would change. It's like they're not thinking of you. So let's move on, you know, let's, but, <sighs> but you're being anchored in the past, right? It's not resolved. You are. You're waiting for something. So I love oh. that agony anchor. That's such a great. Oh, um, thank you. It's just a great vision to, because, you know, we can always cast off the anchor. You can. And once so you once you identify it. what they are, they can be this negative feeling. Or they can be, like you said before, or just a moment ago, about blaming. I, I had a woman, she's a grown woman, she's in her 50s, and she's still blaming that her father was mean to her as a reason why she can't be successful in her life or in relationships. And I finally looked at her and says, what do you get out of feeling that way? Why are you allowing that power to hold you back? You're an adult now. You know, it's not, she wasn't abused, but he was just mean and made comments and stuff. But she stayed into the anger of blaming and she had to work through that. And it finally did. But if she didn't, she would still be, you know, unhappy and all in that victim mode, I should say, in that victim mode of blaming, which is another agony anger. So <laughs> it is. And it's hard. I think sometimes when we're quote unquote in our own story, that's the value of having oh, yes. time with someone like yourself. It's like, I could do all this, but I'm not hearing what I'm saying. I'm just like, sometimes it's just automatic repeat, 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 right? But when you've got a mirror to you and someone like yourself who understands what all this, how it plays, um, it can really help you like step back and go, oh, I could do that different. How else might I think of that, you know, and why am I accepting that as true? Absolutely. Um, in our intensive coaching sessions, this is what we do is to really examine what's holding people back. Asking, I call the magic questions of, you know, this feeling she had served a purpose at some point. But then it became a lifelong story, just like you're suggesting. And stories are an anchor that hold you back. You know, you can whip up all sorts of stories and drama about what's happened in your life, big or small. And that story rules you at that point. And I call that, it becomes what I call the shadow material. Because, you know, it becomes so much a part of you, you lose sense of it. But I bet for now, on, when you're listening to people, you're going to, even on the streets or in the uh so-called social situation, I pick up stories that people repeat over and over again. It's really fascinating. It is fascinating. <laughs> it is fascinating, but those stories are an anchor because they hold you back. But this is what we tell stories about. You could tell a story about Victoria, or you can tell a story about the victim that I presented of blaming something that happened 25 years ago as a reason why she yeah. can't enjoy her life. Yep. And it, I, I always come back to that thing about, because we all have stories. I have stories, right? But I, but I figure if I'm making up a backward story, I might as well just make up a forward story. Yes. Right? Of where yes. I'm going. And then, you know, it's just a story. I can change it. I like it. I don't you like can. it. You can. You yeah. can. But I think I, it's like sometimes people go, but I went to school to be this. And I says, that was a part of your life. You don't have to throw it away. But where do you want to go? You know, precisely. I mean, the the reactions I had when I resigned from my job at a local psychiatric hospital in Illinois, um, it was interesting, the reactions to it. It's like, why would you give up this position? And it's because I felt I had a larger calling mm -hmm. coming on. And I, I felt like I served 
the clients. I developed the program and everyone was in a good place at that point for me to start moving on. And I thought it was a great time to make a transition to a book author speaker. Because at that point, I got a taste of speaking. I would go to the community and talk about eating disorders in the high schools like I did with my old school. And it became a way when I saw how people reacted to those sessions, those um, conferences, that this was another way I could help people. So yeah. my vision just expanded. And, um, you know, yeah, that was scary. It's scary to make a big change and to let go of something so consistent. So I had to examine, did I have any agony anchors? You know, do I value more security or will I be okay with cutting security and venturing and developing my own business? And yeah, I did. And I've been in business since 1992 well, <laughs> on my own. Well, it like you're being pretty successful in your own business, you know. <laughs> and there's been falls uh, along the way. Um, I did uh, resign and I did do the books and so forth. And uh, right before I resigned, I should say, I was thinking about doing some retreats with another woman that worked at the hospital. And we didn't know anything of what we were doing, but we were enthused. But we didn't have a plan. <laughs> so we took a business loan. I was still working almost full time, was relying on my business partner to get this stuff rolling. And it turned out she wasn't doing her part of the deal. So it taught me a lot about trust. It taught me a lot about you really need to develop a map of where you want to go. And it was, you know, a $15,000 mistake. And I learned my lesson. <laughs> but um, it didn't prevent me in the future from trying again into the business I am in now. So that was that middle part story of, yeah, I fell. I learned my lessons. And uh, you carry on. Well, that brings to mind, I was listening to, and I, I wish I could recall who said this, so I can't attribute it to anybody, but it's, so I'm going to paraphrase what was shared, but they were talking about going after goals and success in that. Yes. And so one of the questions that this, the person being interviewed was asked was like, how, what's the hallmark of a successful person? And so, you know, there's all these pat answers, but what this guy said back was so great to me. He said, okay, people think that, you know, you get into business, right? And, and you get hit with all this marketing. Like if you're not making 10 grand a month, by this point, you're failing and blah, blah, blah. And you should be at least over this six figure mark right away. And he says, so let me tell you what, if you are not willing to invest in your own learning and growth, yeah. you're never going to make that kind of income. And he said, it doesn't even have to be not like even college, right? But if you're not investing in people such as yourself, Marianne, to help you grow, get past things, learn new things. He said, you've got to be willing to invest in yourself because that's why you're making money is to grow and, and invest in yourself and learn and be engaged in life, not just to make money. And he said it much better than that. Oh, it was that yeah. whole sense of what are you willing and will you invest in yourself? Because if you want to invest in yourself, why should anybody else invest in your services? Right. Yeah, it's our intention, you know, and my intention is and always has been since I was a teenager is to help people. And whether I made money from it or not was an afterthought. I mean, it turned out, yeah, I became wildly successful. But in my heart, I just I wanted to help people. You were doing the work of help. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, OK, Marianne, I, would, I know that you have. um and uh, you know, have something our listeners can get connected with you further on um, your okay. newsletter. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I'm interested in your Positive Life Answers community as well in the newsletter. So those two things, I think, are really germane to our time. And I'd, if you could share a little more about them. Absolutely. Um, well, my recent venture of my Positive Life Answers podcast came out of this whole idea of my husband and I, we've co-written books on optimism and we wanted a place where people can come and, you know, get articles, get some, uh, right now get the podcast for free, that if they don't, aren't able to come in, that we still reach them and we help them. So my intention of that was also in, in helping people and that's how it's grown. So we have a blog there that talks about whatever episodes we're doing or articles. And of course we have our email community that we work with. Um, 
but um, um, what we're doing is creating some groups or I, I think people call them pods and uh, meet with them on Zoom. And we did that, or I did that uh, individually all, all during COVID. Uh, we meet every week um, and not talk about the pitfalls of being in lockdown, but just what people were doing yeah. to help themselves. And it was a great time for them to start realizing what they wanted in their lives. So like an optimist, we help them create a vision for their lives, empower them by taking responsibility that how I react is what I'll get back. So we teach them the courses of optimism and all the work that we do as a sounding board, because you have to build that ground, you know, the ground of support to launch anything in their lives. So I reach out to people in all different ways, whether it's being interviewed for magazines um, or coming to the website and, and joining our community um, that comes online um, on a weekly meeting. Um, I just, I love that. It, to me, it's not work. It's just, it's just, it's life, living life and enjoying what you do. And uh, I think people need to get permission that they can enjoy life no matter what they're doing. So that, that's kind of the whole premise of the whole system of positive life answers, whether it's the articles, the website, the groups, the podcasts. And uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the creativity of that all because that's new for me. Yeah. Well, in co-creating with people, the people who come into your community, but also your husband, I mean, co-creating is so fertile. You know, there's things that come out of that that never come out of us being siloed. So, um, so we're going to put into the show notes all of your links. So, folks, if you're listening, you're just going to have to go to the show notes. You'll find everything about Dr. Mary. But before we wrap up, would you like to share a parting word of advice or something you were told one time besides from Joy? Um, that really, you know, maybe one of your mentors, or something, but that uh, really took you yeah. somewhere that you went, oh, thank you for that. Oh, Dr. Carl Wolf. It's so simple. And I found a flag about it and I put it in front of my house. And all it said was enjoy life. And it, it was like, oh, because he said, Mary, are you really enjoying life and what you do? And so we worked on that. But that simple little phrase gave me permission that, okay, I need to enjoy the fruits of my labor. I need to enjoy every single day of my life. And I just felt that was so empowering. Um, and that kept me going as well as, you know, having that precise vision of where I want to go from there. So Dr. Wolf was very inspiring. And I think people just need permission yeah. that, you know, regardless of what's going on in your past, you, you must focus on here and now and enjoying yourself. And work or helping people, whatever their jobs are, or as a parents, you know, it shouldn't be such a uh, a difficult thing to do. It shouldn't be unhappy. Just joyful. So enjoy life. I just want to get a little tidbit takeaway um, tonight. So I like that, and I like that you have a flag out front. I'm thinking, yeah, I found a flag. Enjoy life. Yeah, yeah. And and the other thing I want to remind, and I keep this on my desk. This is. This is a little emblem, and then the middle is a little seed. Oh, Did you ever see a, a mustard seed, how tiny it is? But if people just keep the faith, as tiny as that mustard seed, that's all you need. I keep this on my desk because it's so inspiring. A good friend gave that to me. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, which isn't very big, you can grow in faith to empower yourself. And you and I, we work with people to empower them. I don't work with people to have them rely on me as a crutch um, or to rely on therapy as a long-term thing. You know, we want to give them skills so they can take their lives and move ahead, even if they long, you know, in the future, they're not working with us anymore. But, you know, plant that mustard seed today and see where it goes. So I like those two things as the I best like that summary. <laughs> Uh, that's a great, the mustard seed and enjoy life. We'll take yes. that as the closing to the end of the podcast. So um, uh, with mm -hmm. that, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners, thanks for joining us on this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast. You know, we'll be back next week um, okay. with another fantastic guest. I do want to let you know in our community 
Um, if you don't know already, I'm not sure when this one will air. So you, this might be old news for you. But the heartbeat community of Sarah Box, we're opening up a sandbox, which is a private community. Oh. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. going to be cool. So in there, so you heard Dr. Mary talk about, you know, someone might just want to share an idea and get feedback, right? Or they might just need a little encouragement. Um, but it's going to be a community with different areas in it. So um, the only rules are there's no kind of like jumping on people, you know, and being mean and all that stuff. It's like if, if you're no, no critiquing but, or criticizing, no, you, if it's someone feedback asked, with love. <laughs> yeah, no, if someone asks for, hey, I really need some really frank feedback on this, that's yeah. great. But if they're yeah. sharing and they say, I just want to hop. And so we're going to have rooms where people can just have virtual coffees with each oh, that's other. Amazing. They won't oh. need us. So maybe we'll find you in one of those rooms on one Absolutely. of our sessions and people can oh. chat up Dr. Mary. I would find that really a privilege to do. Cool. But I love that idea. That's really wonderful. We're excited about it because yes. it's one of the ways that we can connect people from all around the world. And in fact, mm -hmm. around the, you know, close, near and far. And we'll see where it goes. Maybe it'll have different languages in it. At some I, I could see that. <laughs> I, I, could see it too. I wouldn't be hosting it, however. <laughs> thank right, you well, so much for your time uh, and, and sharing today. I really enjoyed our time together. Me too. Such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. I'm grateful. Thank you. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.